So Millwoods was really created because I wanted to be the one who was there with our family unit. I didn't want to be putting our kids into vacation care. So for us, Millwoods was that avenue um, in order for us to be able to raise our family with us being the primary carers and having the flexibility to be there with them during school holidays as the kids grow and after hours. Well, Carrie, I feel like this interview probably needs to come with a warning because it's all about shoes. <laughs> okay, yes. Uh, now, <laughs> big warning, big warning lights. Now, anyone watching YouTube will see our wonderful guest, Jane Robertson from Millwood Shoes. Uh, she was actually in her workshop and that was completely full of shoes um, as we were talking but of course, Jane's story is uh, not just about her beautiful kids uh, and women's shoes and the line that she's expanded. Um, really encourage you to go check her out on Instagram. It's also about being a rural business woman, managing a business where uh, you're juggling meetings and time zones with international um, manufacturers, when you're juggling your partner, the school studies uh, and schedules, and of course, that emotional cost of running a business by yourself. Um, there's lots of highs, there's lots of lows. Yeah, this interview really does capture all all of those things and really beautifully too. Jane shared very generous, generously um, in this interview. So thank you so much, Jane, for that. Um, but so we have no doubt that you guys will enjoy the interview too. So let's get started um, where we first asked Jane to share her pitch. So Jane, now we love educating women on pitching with confidence uh, can you please tell us a little bit about yourself, your business, and perhaps give us your elevator pitch? Oh, the pressure's on straight up. Um, so Millwoods is a shoe company. Um, I started the business about seven years ago, and we started with children's shoes only, and in particular, the leather moccasins for kids, um, just because I wanted A, leather shoes that my children could put on themselves that weren't sort of neon, Velcro, nylon shoes. So... Long story short, first shipment came in. I found out I was pregnant with my third child and the world decided to get really difficult. Um, so they were a really hard sell at the time. Um, $80 for a pair of kid shoes um, was really expensive back then. Um, so this was 2017. And um, once you got the kids into the shoes, they wouldn't get out of them. So the parents kept asking for what the kids wanted. And it became really apparent that I either had to do something drastic or probably shut the business down because we weren't selling anywhere near enough shoes for kids to um, make it viable. So not looking defeat in the face, I can't accept that too well. I started designing a woman's shoe. So we started with our leather Linden loafer in Leopard um, and we launched that. And long story short, between launching that, Wife in the Bush, COVID, online marketplaces doing exceptionally well. Here we are today with, um, I think there's over 37 variants now that we've got here. Um, and we've just ordered our largest order ever for autumn, winter next year. It's crazy to think that it's what, early November and I'm not even thinking about summer. I'm actually even past winter. I'm on to like summer in 18 months time. So yeah, that's probably the short sort of history of Millwoods. Um, in terms of elevated pitching, ugh, it's always the one that makes me feel really awful because I just feel like, oh my God, you've got such a finite amount of time to try and tell people how amazing you think your business is. Um, but I think in a nutshell, owning a pair of Millwoods is a bit almost like a rite of passage for a woman. Um, it's about classic shoes that transcend time, uh, they're a shoe that can be worn anywhere. You dress them up, you dress them down, indoors, outdoors. They're made to last and they are very much um, a foundation of an Australian woman's outfit every day. Um, they give you the strength that you need to really cement yourself and step forward in the day. Oh, amazing. And I can, we can see you, for our listeners, we can actually see Jane Darling from her, uh, her warehouse and you can definitely see that the business is has grown substantially uh, despite through all those challenges. Um, and I love I love how you've mentioned that, you know, you started with one particular customer, a target customer in mind, which was kids. Mm -hmm. 
but soon pivoted to women, adults. And that was, that was perhaps the trick that you needed at that particular time um, to get that next step and that next milestone and that sort of, um, that, that, that sort of growth to, to continue expanding to the point where you're, you know, putting your largest order. So it's, it's something that I think um, I, I just want to, I just wanted to highlight because when you start a new venture, you don't necessarily go with the market that you thought you would go with. <laughs> Not at all. Evolution and change every day. Like it's, it's yeah, every, I'd like to say, you know, we are absolutely rock solid. This is what we're doing. But if you keep there with your blinkers on and you don't let, you know, change happen, I don't think you'll grow with it. And I think that's so important that you need to be able to grow with it. So as things change, you have to sit there some time and go, you know what? I need to change this. And it's not necessarily what I started out to do, but let's keep going. Absolutely. So we know that um, many Australian businesswomen, in fact, about a third of them are based in rural or regional areas and you obviously represent this incredible cohort of women what do you see as the greatest strength as a business owner when it comes to being a bush-based business I think it's part of a really really good story Um, sometimes I think that rural and regional communities are almost forgotten as the laggards and that we're just out here sometimes and we're the country hicks and we don't really you know sometimes it's like oh they're just the country folk um, but I think you take those sorts of sometimes views and use them to your advantage. So recently I was at a trade fair and I had so many people stop by and go, so where are you based? Are you Melbourne or Sydney? I was like, well, neither. I literally run it from a farm. And some people you can sit there and see, um, it's almost like they just glaze over and keep going. It's like, okay, you're not legit. And other people actually stand there and they have a conversation with you and you've got this ability to actually capture them and you have um, this chance then to really talk about your story and it gets them to stop enough so that you can have that further conversation but I think when it comes to regional Australia we know how to stand together and if there's one thing that happens out here it's that there is everybody is literally out to help everybody you might not necessarily feel it at the time but if you just find a way to ask a really small question you would be surprised what unfolds Um, and community is just so important when you're in these regional areas and that is such when you are doing something solely on your own um, because I had this conversation this week with my girlfriend and that like while my husband and I are in this together when you look at the company structure he's not in this I'm 100% doing this on my own and then I have beautiful contractors that come and help but I spend a lot of time sitting in this warehouse on my own. So I think when you do walk out that door and you head in to grab a coffee and all those sorts of things, your community is not just about my business. It's about the greater microeconomy that's around me and creating something that, you know, we all help to feed off each other. That's beautifully said. And I couldn't, we couldn't, we couldn't believe, uh, well, we believe it and we also see it um, because we often say that when a woman starts a business, she's actually setting up this um, beautiful uh, ecosystem of business relationships around her and um, whether that be with community or customer it's also with you know who we potentially employ um, who we yeah. potentially source from as, as as vendors or suppliers who we collaborate with it's just you know uh, it, it's a beautiful ecosystem it really is and I think that's it, it's very easy I think for the females to come together um, because I feel like you know, we're in this really beautiful age where, you know, anyone can pretty much do anything if you just ask for the right amount, the right sort of help. And, you know, those minorities are being built up so that everybody does get a chance. You can get a chance. It's not always easy to get the chance, but I think out here people watch and they listen and you're visible because you're not necessarily like you're not what part of a million people in like you know 10 square kilometer area you have the chance to pe- to be seen if that's what you want love that um as Kerry mentioned before you're joining us today from your warehouse um, which is located also near your house if not on your property um 
And we know from a recent micro but mighty report by the McKell Institute that 40% of women in the micro business sector in Australia run online businesses, which Mm -hmm. obviously also fits the kind of business model that you're running. What has really helped your visibility um, for Millwoods in terms of supporting this incredible growth that you've experienced? So in terms of visibility, um, this is a conversation that my sister and Laura and I have on a very frequent basis because I'm not, um, it feels very inauthentic for me to be out there selling PR to myself. Um, it just doesn't come naturally for me to sit there and go, hey, I'm Jane. I run this amazing shoe business from my farm. And um, I find it a real struggle. But in terms of what's really helped visibility as it's grown, and I have to say it, it is PR, the very limited amount of PR that we get, that and I think also standing by our key product features in terms of quality, comfort, and really trying to deliver on what it is we say that we're going to do. Um, I think you can sell so many stories, but if you don't deliver on what you say you're going to do, then there's no point and pe- you'll be seen the wrong way. You know, people see through it in like two seconds flat. Like the world can also be a really nasty place once you get into social media and those sorts of things. So it's being able to, I think, stand really strongly behind our product um, and know that our quality and our product service is its second to none of what sets us apart. And then having um, the guts every now and then to find a story and pitch it without feeling like you're being really conceited, um, which I find is the hardest part because we have had some really beautiful pieces in like pages like Country Style and those sorts of things. And you sort of sit there and go, well, I'm just here doing my thing. And what makes you know, Sarah down the road, not as exciting to tell a story about as what I'm saying here, but it just is how those stories get told sometimes. Um, so I think in terms of visibility, um, very much so being able to be really authentic in terms of delivering on our product and using PR where you can for your advantage. Love it. Um, and I always, it always comes to mind, you know, that um, when a couple of things, as you were talking, <laughs> I was trying to want, I was thinking about, you know, is it, is it because it's, um, you know, the media has a certain stigma to it in terms of how it works, but I can guarantee is as long as you break it down into, you know, a personal, like a human touch story, um, it, it becomes so, so much more palatable and, you know, if that, if that publication is there to serve humans that are interested in a certain area, then your business is probably going to be relevant. Um, well, I think that's, um, somebody said the other day, like, it's just not, it's not gross to self-promote. And I think no, when it's, yeah. um, whether it's, you know, you growing up as a child and carrying all these, you know, like you don't want to be the tall poppy, you want to do well, but you don't want to be the one that does too well. Um, and, you know, as a child, when you grow up, sometimes, you know, you have these almost limitations put on you and to then to, to fight those off as an adult sometimes is really difficult because you're like going, well, I know if I just kind of, it's not gross to self-promote and if I really focused on that, I could probably do a lot more PR, but it's really breaking that down and having the strength to step outside that and talk about your story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It would be interesting. And I often, I often go forward with this because I, I wonder, I wanted, I'm glad you went there because it comes back, it comes, there's a few elements here like imposter syndrome or, yep. you know, that whole bragging, you feel like you don't want to brag. And I'm like, well, you're not bragging if it's facts. Correct. Um, yep. <laughs> it's yes. just sharing that story. And I always wonder if um, this would help, you know, just kind of when you actually do your story and someone else was telling it, but it's based on facts. And you're like, wow, that's fascinating. And it's like, well, that's what you're doing. That's <laughs> <Yeah>. your business. <laughs> really. And, and often because it's where the ones that are fronting the business, where where the ones that are showing up and representing our businesses, because we don't have big teams. We don't have lots of different staff members in a, you know, uh, we are the spokesperson. So you are talking about it on a very personal level as well. So personal. Yeah. Because that's, um, it's not just a business. 
it's like my kids get off the bus and I run, I run up to the bus at the front to bring them home and they all come in and sit over here behind me with the colouring in tables. So it's not like it's, you know, I walk out the door and I leave, you leave it all behind. Like, and so many parents who run businesses from home would 100% agree with that. It's that. And half the time at the moment, because we're working with Spanish factories at the moment, I don't start work till eight o'clock at night. But that means I have to tap out, you know, at the worst witching hour because like I need to go and get ready and I might not have had time. But then it buys me flexibility that, okay, right, well, I can be at a nine o'clock school assembly, but that's okay because I'll just work through till nine, 10 or 11 o'clock at night. Like it just is, it's so real. And I think sometimes you feel like because you're Groundhog Day doing that, that it's actually not worth speaking about. But when honestly, I love hearing about other people who work like this because like okay everyone goes oh you know it's nine to five and you've got to find balance but balance is literally comes down to however you do it and it's so personal um so I think that's where it's sort of like right well I might run a shoe business but I could be running a I'm not really ag related I just live on the farm but you know like it's farming right it could be sun up to sundown it rains today so you can't do it so you have to do it tomorrow like it just is yeah I think we just have to work on our own terms and be unapologetic about it so um you know you just make it make it work for you and and your family correct Attention business savvy women, elevate your entrepreneurship with our Mums & Co membership. It's the ultimate network designed for women just like you. Join our online events, connect with like-minded mum business owners and gain expert advice tailored to your journey. Boost your business exposure and success in just 30 seconds. That's all it takes to register for our free sign-up membership. Visit mumsandco.com.au or visit us via the link in the show notes. You are a mum to three children. Um, mm-hmm. what, what, are, what are some of the ways that you've blended the two, motherhood and business, over the last few years? Yep. Um, I think you've touched a bit on that, you know, in terms of the working hours. Was there anything else? Well, the business started because of the kids. I um, was in corporate governance when I had my son. Um, I was working for a health agency in town in corporate governance. And as soon as I sort of became pregnant with James, it became really apparent to me that he was going, like it was going to take five years, obviously, but he would have 12 weeks holidays a year and I would have four. And my husband, um, he's still my husband, um, but at the time he was a pilot for um, Regional Express. So he was, his hours could have been anything. So one of us had to be consistent and, I grew, had a really fortunate upbringing of never having to go to vacation care um, and very few times did we ever have babysitters because um, of the way that my, my dad always worked from home. That was, he, his office was always at home. So I actually grew up watching this. Um, Mum was a nine to fiver um, somewhere else and dad, his business was home. So school holidays and those sorts of things, I had the pure luxury of being here and I was like, I wanted that for my children. So I think in terms of blending motherhood and business I went in search of something and a way to be here for my children um now is that the right choice for our family I don't know because I tell you what sometimes this business is so hard that I literally just want to throw it in um I think only like two weeks ago I was on flipper seeing how much I could sell it for (laughs) but it's just and then like this week I'm fine and I think it's really getting clear on I think what values you want to instill and then how you make that work for you um so Andrew resigned from flying last year um purely because the kids are getting older now and he wanted to be around to see James play football on the weekends because you you know you were guaranteed one weekend off every four or five weeks or something so you know you get 20 percent of your son's life so I think it's um in terms of blending it, I don't feel like I had a choice. It was it was the way that it needed to be in order for me to deliver on a family unit that I wanted to give my kids because a nine to five role was not going to ever have that flexibility for us. Um, and what's the point of one parent being on holidays if the other parent's never on holidays? So when do you really have that lovely, beautiful time together as a family? It becomes so precious. Um, James is 10 now. I've got eight years and he's done, literally eight years. And like at 10, he's probably not going to want to know me in the next three years. 
So, yeah, we're, we're all at the we're same. We're all the same. Yeah. I, we, we all have boys. Of course, they're going to want to know us. Of course. Is that because I still wash for him? <laughs> Whatever it takes. <laughs> Whatever it takes. <laughs> I started teaching James to use the washing machine this week. I was like, oh, come on. You just, you got to press these three buttons. That's all you got to do. I think it's just really, for our family, Andrew is a massive support and I can't do what I do without Andrew. And Andrew actually can't do what he does without me. And I think the two of us being, we talk a lot. Um, I would like to think that I'm his greatest supporter and that he is mine. And, and I think having that really, we talk and talk and talk. It's, they're not always nice conversations. They're not always conversations you want to have, but I think, because we're having the conversations, we are we are able to blend the business with our families. Absolutely. And shout out to all the amazing, supportive um, partners, yep. husbands uh, who support women in business because it really is such an instrumental part of our journey um, when we're doing it with, with kids, like, you know, in all aspects, in all aspects, whether it's, it's domestic load, it's mental load, it's business success because, um, yeah, you're really key and we thank you for all your support. Yeah, you can't get, you can't go without it 100%. Since Andrew's finished flying, like he works seven days a week now. So it's like, and it looks different. Like he's either out contract fencing, he flies privately, he's being a stock agent, he's studying, he's running our own farm, he's helping me with the kids. Like, I don't think in our family unit it's um, building one up for the other. We're both building together. Um, and this is really interesting. Last year, the International Women's Day was how are you breaking the mould? And I genuinely sit there and say in our family unit, we're creating a mould of true equality that my life is not more important than Andrew's and that Andrew's career is not more important than mine and there are definitely times when one's at the forward and one's at the back but that's always swapping and it's always chopping and changing and that's where I really come back to the, the conversations in that um, and respect. Andrew respects what I do just as much as I respect what he does. Yeah I feel very fortunate that I have Andrew because of that. Yeah and it's not just in terms of you know the the, the financial benefits, I think it's actually the the relationship that you have with your children benefits that, that come into, you know, that win mm. the most when they have both access to both parents. Which the, it is, yeah. Cause it's like, and I actually really, like, James will ask me, I have three children, I only want to talk about James though, um, which, but James will ask me to play football with him just as much as he'll play, ask Andrew. And I sort of take great pride in that. And it's like, Whereas the girls will ask me to play loom bands. I'm like, oh, God, do I have to sit on the floor and feed these stupid little things? Like, okay, fine, sit down. I don't enjoy that as much. So it's really it's Okay, girls, we won't, we, won't, we won't play this part back to you <laughs> of the, uh, to the interview. <laughs> yes, it's totally fine. I get you. I get you. It's, it's fine not to thoroughly enjoy some activities that our children make us do. Okay, let me take us back to, um, you know, the growth that you've experienced over the last few years. You've mentioned that, you know, it has grown in leaps and bounds. Mm -hmm. How has that growth at different stages of your business impacted your relationship with risk as a business, as a small business owner? Oh, my God, risk. It's just this never-ending black cloud over you, particularly when um, – your product-based business and growth. Because um, what's really interesting is that you're always in a negative cash cycle um, because you, so when I say that, it's you take every single cent that you can and you reinvest back in. So you're constantly reinvesting in the business. So you draw out, the like for us, we draw out the bare minimum and because I don't, don't really want an investor. I really want to push Millwoods on its own. I want it to be our own thing so that we can manipulate how it works for us. So 
I have got to be comfortable with being uncomfortable in risk because if I am not, we're not going to grow. And I think it, so we're seven years in now. Oh my God, that's so scary to say seven years in. Um, And I would say risk is something that I consider every single day. So we sell in seasons. So we have two main selling seasons, autumn, winter and spring, summer. And we sell so far in advance that it becomes really, it's risky. And that's the only thing, like it's sitting here trying to think of a different word. um, But really you're making a call and you're drawing a line in the sand so far in advance. So we ordered autumn, winter. So it's November. We ordered autumn, winter five weeks ago, end of September. That doesn't, that arrives in stores February, March, April. So you're making calls on things right at the moment when you're watching all these other trends in other markets now, when you go, oh my God, I made a call six weeks ago. Oh God, I should have done this. Um, Because I can see that trend happening in an overseas market. And you're like, you just have to go bring it back to our customer and go, am I delivering on what our customer wants? That's what I was interested in because it, we're all, we're all going to have to be exposed to risk at some point. And what we do is we know that this is a risk and therefore we put these measures in place or these mitigants in place. And you say, well, well, I'm watching trends or I'm doing customer research. It's all those little activities that help you mitigate that risk. Um, yeah, and so it's, I have someone who helps me with customer service now. So Emily helps me about nine hours a week. That doesn't mean I don't do customer service at all um, because those emails are gold in terms of really understanding your customer and what they have issues with with your product. So whether that's like there's a fit issue, a colour issue, or they like the hair on, they don't like the hair on, they want more suede. If you aren't paying attention to those customer service emails and the comments that come in, I think you're going into risk blind. So it's really important, I think, to keep your eyes really open, but also be laser focused on what I'm trying to deliver to my customer and why in the past this has worked. I think it's so scary talking about it. It's so scary because it's a product-based business and you are, my lead times are such a long time. Um, so really it's five months is a lead time and things, you know, in the social media world and the world that we live in, like five months can be archaic. Jane, at Mums & Co, we talk about the idea of harmony. So you mentioned, um, before the, you know, the concept of balance being whatever you make it. So here we call it harmony and we describe it as a triangle of our ambition, our livelihood and our well being inviting you to describe the shape of what a good life looks like for you. How many sides to, to a shape can you get? As many as you want. An octagon? <laughs> yeah. Octagon. <laughs> One's up, then it leans to the next, and then there's something else that's dropping. So it leans into the next thing, and then the next one, you know, it might be running stable, and then it kind of has a little bit of a levitation, but then, oh, look, it comes back around to the side. I think it's this really weird-looking circle, so that's why I'll say an octagon um, because it's – I love that thing where people go, oh, you can't, you can have it all but you can't have it at once. And I think that's actually really true. Um, I struggle to be fit but I have beautiful friends and a great business and a really amazing marriage and beautiful – so it's sort of like – okay, one day I'll have time to exercise the amount that I'd like to. So that sort of might be the bit down the bottom of the octagon that's leaning out, not the bit that's leaning in. Um, And I think it's try not to be too granular in your approach because the pendulum swings and it can swing on a dime. Um, Yeah, it's so hard. But it's not any more hard than anybody who's being in a paid position. Andrew and I have these discussions as well, you know, that you, all right, that's it. He's packing in, he's going back to work. But it's sort of you sit there and you go, where where do we come back to our values and what do we want for our family unit? And what does that look like for us? So I think that's where it is that give and take. And um, there's just so many moving parts that, yep, an octagon might, might be a good one. That's the shape. 
Thank you. Yeah. That, that's a that's a terrific, that's a beautiful answer. Um, and the final question that we love to ask is in the spirit of women supporting women, who are the mumbitious, the women unapologetically blending their ambition and their motherhood that you would like to say hello to? Oh, wow. Where do we start? Where do we start? So there's probably one in particular who Joe and I both started our respective businesses at exactly the same time. There was an incubator that was going on in Wagga. Um, so my beautiful friend, Joe Palmer, she actually won the Rural Women's Award quite a few, well, was it three or four years ago now? Um, Joe's a really beautiful friend of mine. Um, we actually have this little date. We've already put it in our calendars. We're going to um, the Maldives and we're going to get one of those overwater bungalows with the water slides that come down um, when our business has reached 10. Um, so I've got a lot of work to do to save that money in the next three years. But Jo, um, I was talking to her last night and it's just never-ending support and to completely understand. She's just picked her family up and they've just moved to Singapore for her husband's role and it's like she's never left. She's still here. It's So I think um, Jo, with, she has pointer remote roles for a bit of a shout-out for those people that don't know her. Um, she really, her business specialises in finding remote work for people, male or female, um, and then the other person that I will actually give a shout out back to is my beautiful sister-in-law, who is Georgie Robertson, which is the regional PR co. Um, George, um, for feeding my children ice cream at breakfast on the rare occasion that she has at breakfast time. Um, it's it's really lovely to have incredible women who I who you've watched go through really difficult times, seeing the beauty at the other end and the gold that is at the other end. Um, and the hard part about that is watching them burn themselves out while they're doing it. But in saying that, it's so lovely to see how far they've come and how well they've both done. Um, and I think they're also both incredibly different. Um, so that's why with children at really different ages as well. So George is, her girls are almost through um, high school and Joe's a really little like mine. So they're, yeah, I think it's, they're, two of my biggest supporters um, for very, very different reasons um, and very different personalities. So they bring so much to a conversation, which is really lovely. What an amazing little cohort the three of you must make. Very fortunate. <laughs> very fortunate. Yeah. Super yeah. amazing. We're very aware of Joe and the amazing work that both of them do. Um, yep. we've actually advertised our roles at Mums & Co with Jo as well but she was also a member from way back and when you were talking about read through your customer emails I vividly remember when she actually gave us some feedback on our membership product yep and like, we've got to get that sorted <laughs> which um, thankfully we did uh, and Georgie's work in, in regional PR and lifting women up incredible this, you know she's indefatigable so yep. two amazing amazing women 100% Thanks so much for joining us on Mumbition, the podcast today. Now, if you'd like to connect with Jane, you can find her on our membership directory on our member platform. And if you haven't already joined the thousands of business owning women just like you, join us at mumsandco.com.au. We have membership tiers to suit women at all stages of business and motherhood. And if you enjoyed today's podcast, please rate and review us. Lucy and I love reading your reviews and your feedback. It also means that um, more women in business can be supported and they can tap into these mumbitious stories to inspire and inform them. How do I look after my shoes better? Oh, how do you look after your shoes better? Do you know what? If you've got laces, undo them when you take them off and open them up properly to put them in so that you don't crush and roll the back of your heels down. That would be my number one thing because if I watch my son putting his shoes on, I literally, so um, all our loafers come with a shoehorn um, to really stop the back of the shoes collapsing in. This is just something that we do in our house now. We have shoehorns that are everywhere. I was so sick of the kids literally ruining their shoes and then getting little blisters because they were cutting in at the wrong place. So please undo your shoelaces properly and then slide them off and open them up nicely to put your foot back in every day.